Well, hello, golfers. It's uh, time for Better Golf with Kevin and Jake Hame, a couple of PGA pros uh, from Ottawa, Canada. We're in our studio today. It's episode 17, Jake, trying to help people play some better golf. Uh, let's get to it. Big show today. We're only doing a monthly uh, podcast in the winter months, which is sort of off season for us up here. We've got to wrap the European uh, tour, which the race to Dubai ended last week with John Rahm uh, ending up on top, a Love big it. win for him. And and we're going to talk actually about Rahm's action today a little bit. Uh, I don't think that guy's got a weakness. Some of his stats are incredible. Hasn't won the major yet, but this kid is incredible. And no, I, yeah, I'd really like to look at his golf swing a little bit today. You were touching on him on the radio show on Saturday just because he won the race to Dubai and everything. And I had this gut feeling when you were talking about it, and I've been thinking about it since then, and I think I still agree with the gut feeling, which is I think of the elite players, John Rahm is the most underrated player on the PGA Tour. That I'm sure there's someone who's not in the top level that is wildly good that we don't know about yet that earns that title more. But in terms of the top guys, you're right. Because he's had a few blow-ups or it doesn't quite happen for him in majors – and he's been around what seems like so long, even though he's incredibly young, people don't give him the respect of his skill he should be getting. And I think he's going to be big as he continues to play here. Well, he, yeah. I mean, he already is, but yeah, I, he's going yeah. to continue. Okay, let gonna... me give you something here just quickly, and then we've got to continue to set up the show. So uh, uh, current top 10 golfers in the official world golf rankings and their performances before turning 25 by wins, number of top fives, and average true strokes gained. So this came out mid-season on one of the websites I was uh, researching on for the radio show, actually, midweek last week. And Tiger Woods, number one, uh, before turning 25, uh, 103 events, 26 wins, just just, just under 25% winning percentage, uh, 50 top fives out of 103, and his, his uh, true strokes gained was uh, 2.7. So that's Tiger Woods. He's number one. Number two is John Rahm. He's ahead of Rory McIlroy. He's ahead of Justin Thomas. He's ahead of Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, Justin Rose, all of those players. Yeah, I think a lot of people would 76, tell you. 76, hang on, 76 events played, 8 wins, 27 top fives, and a 1.9 true uh, strokes gain. So he's number two all time behind Tiger Woods in those stats, which are big stats. Yeah, hearing, hearing that again, a lot of people would tell you he's good, but people wouldn't as assume that. I mean, I really do think that big things are coming i don't think that's saying even that much i think a lot of people know big things are coming but john rom is an incredible player and i think his swing is also unique compared to a lot of the other guys so talking about it no is a good idea. we'll talk about a swing today uh we'll set up the president's cup for everybody we'll give you some good christmas gift ideas my god i googled christmas golf gift ideas it's hard to buy things for you golf, get apparently. the putter mat that you do when you're on the toilet and you get the plastic you know, drink dispenser. It's a bunch of garbage. So we're going to give you the real top gifts today for your golfer. I think we should do that. And then we'll recap uh, 2019 uh, PGA Tour a little bit. Uh, Tiger Woods. I don't know. I, I'm still trying to figure out his win at the Masters. I'm still trying to figure out where that sits in. It's too fresh to put an actual number on it, right? But you've got, you've got Jack Nicklaus in 86 from my experiences sure watching the game yeah, i mean yeah. you can go back i guess to ben hogan in 53 and but you got jack nicholas in 86 you've got tiger in 97 when he won by 12 you've got the tiger slam which included the win by 15 at pebble beach yes a and then you might have this uh maybe the most the biggest story in sports let alone golf this year and maybe the biggest comeback in the history of sports as far as you know, people have had comebacks based on having cancer or having an injury. Th this was, this guy was, he couldn't walk for months at a time, and then he comes back and wins another major. Plus, he had the DUI, and he had the, the Perkins stuff and, and the, the fire hydrant. There's so much stuff. So it's an, inc it's an epic comeback. And uh, I don't know where it stands, but I interviewed a guy on the radio, and we were both talking about that same thing, that drive on 17 when he, he got the lead on 16 and then stood up on 17, which normally would be a big block. You know, Tiger, he might still make par or birdie, but he wouldn't hit, and he just piped it down the middle. And it's it's one of my moments I'll always remember. We were standing in this studio watching it with about yeah. 20 customers and some family and our, our staff, 
No lessons happening that afternoon watching Tiger no, win was, that match. It was cool. It was it was pretty special. Um, you're right. Recency bias is obviously a factor. I think we'll need a little more time to separate before we understand it in the context of uh, history. But I was more that derived more emotion from me than almost watching any other golf event in my life. Whether that's just because of the comeback and I'm such a Tiger fan at my age. So what was the emotion? Was it vindication that you like him and see everybody? We told you he's still here. Was well, it, I think, I think was it surprise? What was it? What were the emotions? I think some of that is, some of it is probably what you said first. Some of it is the, I told, every, I knew he wasn't done. But I actually think, I actually had the feeling watching it that I got to see something that I hope but never thought would happen again. In, in my heart of hearts. I knew it could. I hoped it would. But I, I, I didn't know that it would happen again. And I'm not sure we knew it could. I was also a certain point. old enough at this point to really appreciate it and be passionate as a fan. And I loved watching Tiger as a kid. And it meant a lot to me as a kid. But I was pretty young. Right? So it's a different feeling to me. Yeah, I, for I you, could, it's more of a primal emotion. I mean... I can you, appreciate greatness properly. Which is not something when I was watching as a kid. I had a perspective on I it know, all. But you also have some kind of a raw connection because when your childhood hero is a certain guy, it's even more than someone who's just a fan based on this conscious knowledge of how good he is, right? You grew up, I don't know about idolizing, but w there's nothing more pure than a 10 year old loving an athlete. No, so. it was, it, uh, Tiger Neat was connection. the guy, right? There was nobody else. And I didn't like Phil Mickelson solely for the reason that he wasn't Tiger and he won events against Tiger. I mean, that was, that's all that I cared Not about. Not many. You head know. to head against Tiger. You know, um, uh, interesting to watch this version of Tiger and, and to watch so many people who don't know what they're talking about, about golf swing motions and club paths and balance and, you know, pressure mapping and everything. Try to talk about his swing and relation to what it was and before i mean he's not near the guy he was but uh, that was a clinical even at the uh, the tournament over in japan it was a clinical study yeah he ironed everybody to death at the zozo yeah even more so than the masters actually when i think back to the masters there was a there was a there, there was a little more of a aggressive athleticism about that win he was getting some decent club head speed but at the zozo you know that was the name i couldn't think of it uh, in japan he just basically, it's like, uh, you know, it was a clinical ball control thing. Yeah. And it's neat to see, you know. Uh, unfortunately, you can't kind of have both. The early Tiger was this violent, uh, incredible club head speed athlete and overpowered his competition. Remember at the Masters in 97? I don't know if you do, Jake, but he blew it over the bunker, the, the bunker that Sandy Lyle hit it in on. 18 on the left hand side up the hill he just blew it over and hit a sandwich onto the green they had to that was re really tiger woods is the reason why tom fazio came in and did a lot of a lot of extra rebuilding of of the masters because they realized that the modern player if not just tiger after tiger would just overpower the golf course and we got to start moving tees back right so he was that guy and and at the zozo he was this surgeon just clinically you know Every iron he hit was pin high. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know to say, Shaped though, the that, ball both ways. But hold on. I don't think to say that Tiger wasn't the surgeon before is a fair statement. I mean, Jack Nicklaus commented after Tiger won the Masters that he's never seen a player with better distance control on his irons. That isn't just a new thing. Tiger has always been that person, but you're right. It's now his primary skill, right? Where, And I, I think there is a bit of a reality there. Tiger's probably not going to compete on the courses that are the long bombers courses anymore to the Ooh. same level that he did. Only because his driver is not accurate enough to make him compete against some of these guys. Depends on the course, yeah, Jake. It depends on the course and, and where the trouble is. It's not as cl as clear as just saying it's 7,500 yards. Because, I mean, he was... he was. Uh, no, but you, I think a launch monitor picked him up at 127 miles an hour uh, at Innisbrook early in the year. So he's still got some speed. But... I know. It's not the speed that's the problem. It's the driving accuracy and the consistency off the tee. If you look at someone like Beth Page, that came out, right? He had problems at Beth Page because he got himself into situations too often. To yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think score. I agree with you. If you're 127 miles an hour, 
and you can work the ball both ways. I think you can you can play on those distance courts. I don't know. Ben Hogan, I mean, I've never heard anyone say he was the longest of his day and he couldn't win on certain courses and if you're a if you're if you're, if you're as amazing as Tiger was at the Zozo just mowing people down and never making a mistake, I think you can win anywhere. Well, yeah, really hold do. on, hold on. I'm not saying he can't win. I'm saying he's probably not going to compete as much on the long bomb and gouge courses. Instead, he's going to probably be more relevant at courses like the Zozo Championship, where it's all about hitting it to the right spot on the green and distance control perspective because there's so many levels to the green. And interestingly enough, that's also true at Augusta, right? It's all about hitting the right part of yeah. the green at Augusta National. And I think that those courses are the ones where Tiger's going to shine the brightest because his iron play is so standout. I do, I do also like the fact that his new body kind of prevents him from doing that six-inch dip, which I... I, I really will spend, you know, as much time as people want to discussing swing analysis or theory on Tiger, but that was really his downfall. That's why he got stuck. And and, and if you look at old tape of Tiger in 97, he didn't have near as much of it. He got into that kind of that squatty drop-down move uh, through his, you know, after, I would say after Butch and mostly with with Sean Foley that kind of stuff you know and but Hank Haney's book he talked about that Tiger was doing it back then and that was really to me his flaw and he didn't do it really early and he's not doing it as much now at all but I think yeah I think anyway let's move on from Tiger I want to talk John Rahm okay. what do you like about John Rahm's action so John Rahm just won the race to Dubai I gave you a couple of stats earlier there's lots of great stats on John Rahm uh, on the PGA Tour already He's won $16 million. He's not even 25 yet, right? He's got four seconds. Uh, let's see here. He's got four seconds, five thirds, 32 top tens, and 75 events played on the PGA Tour for $16 million. That's a pretty impressive hit percentage. 32 oh my God. for 75. And, and listen, as you said, he's a little under the radar in some weird way. Well, I think he's under this the year, radar. Hang on. This year, he only played 13 times in the race to Dubai on the European Tour. Three first, two seconds, a third, and, and two more top tens. Yeah, that'll do it. So eight out of 13 tournaments, he was in the top ten. Uh, so he didn't play a lot in Europe, and he still won it. And I don't know what it is about him. He, he's one of these old soul guys. Sometimes I think bigger men with the... with. Maybe it's his facial hair. Well, he looks older, right? Because he's big and he has full facial hair. He looks older than he is. And it's another example, I think, of when a guy's on tour for about four years, which he has been, right? He premiered in 2015 at the Waste Management. You almost start forgetting how young the guy is because it feels like he's been around a long time. Yeah. He's played in Ryder Cups. You know, he's done all these things. And you forget, like, this guy's 25. His only weakness, is he 25 now or is he 24? I don't know. His only weakness is uh, his emotional fire, which also makes him great. But that really stupid play at the players this year, trying to hit it on the green from the bunker, right? The stubbornness yeah. and then the anger afterwards and the reaction about it. That's his only weakness. Physically, th there really aren't any. And, and so much so, I mean, Tim Mickelson, who was his coach in college, uh, Phil's brother, quit his job to come out and caddy for him. That's how much the Mickelsons, but you can say what you want about Phil. He knows golf. Uh, he understands talent. He knows golf, yeah. Uh, quit his job to come out and, and do that and be his agent, I think, too. There was a, I don't know if they still are. but um, Okay, what do you like about his action? It's an interesting action. It's not very, it's not like an Adam Hadwin, pure, perfect position golf swing. What no, do you like true. about it? You know, what I like about his golf swing is how simple and rotational it is as a general idea. Right, He doesn't have an incredibly long golf swing. It's compact, it's tight, and it's very based on rotation, which allows him to keep the face very square at impact consistently with maintaining power, which is great. Yeah. You know, I think if people think characteristically, what do they think about John Rahm, what they see is the shorter-looking golf swing. And I think the reason his swing is shorter-looking is because instead of hinging his wrists conventionally, he has that extension and flexion in his wrist more like Dustin Johnson right he flexes the lead wrist and bows the wrist essentially yeah it's bowed That's and what... as a result he winds up not being able to f hinge his wrist as much so his lead wrist his left wrist for a right-handed player when we say it's in flexion 
that means it, it's bowed a little bit. Yes. So if you took, if you make a fist, just extend your arm out, make a fist, everybody, and then push your fist down. That's flexing your forearm yeah. and the muscles in there. That's flexion. And if you if you think about how your hand can move, it can move in multiple directions, but it can only move so many directions at the same time. If you flex your forearm, it can't hinge or rotate as much. Yeah. So very much like Dustin Johnson. So it, it stabilizes as long as you have the strength to do it. Uh, when I work with a beginner lady and she has flexion in her wrist, the club literally collapses and gets stuck in behind and they can't get the club back into position. Well, so that's funny. That's you need a lot of strength to do this move. That's an interesting parallel, right? Because I think one of the most interesting parallels between that is it's one of the most common things for beginner ladies to have a problem with because a lot of beginner ladies don't have the forearm strength to support the club if the club gets into the wrong position to begin with and so their wrist collapses, they don't support the weight these stronger players are doing it almost on purpose, but they have the strength to then stabilize the face and keep it square. Yeah, the other thing that's interesting about his move, and you've got to do a full analysis frame by frame, which we've done of the backswing, but his shaft is actually vertical going back, which means that the club head is pointed more straight up and down. So it's more vertical than it is on the way down. He shallows the club nicely yes. in the downswing, which gives him, I don't know about extra leg, but maintains leg, creates speed from the inside. So... You know, a lot of people, if they tried to just bow the wrist at the start, they'd just suck the club way in behind them, get it stuck in behind them, and lay it off or get it too flat. John Rom doesn't do that. Well, it's a very similar it's a very similar backswing, frankly, to Dustin Johnson, yeah. right? And the reason why people note how John Rom's swing looks short and DJ's doesn't is because Dustin Johnson's a lankier, longer individual who turns more than John, John Rom does. So John Rom's swing, which is more compact as a 6-foot, 220-pound thick individual... It looks shorter, but in both their six cases, two. yeah, that's what his profile is he says. Two? That's what his profile says. Yeah, it's a big guy. At at, you know, in both cases, because their shaft has to go more vertical up to counteract the fact that the shaft would be laid off for most players with that wrist flexion. Yeah, you got to be very careful trying to copy it. I, I maintain you also need strength. I mean, a lot of people you watch the analyses on uh, YouTube and whatnot. They say, oh, if if you're in flexion like that, you just have to turn and the club stays square. Let me tell you, if 98% of people that I teach bowed their wrist and got that club in that position and then just turned and that club was shut like that, they just hit smother hooks. So there's more to it than that. You, you've got to maintain the integrity of the, of the arms in front of the chest and the square position through impact, which is doable. But it, it does require some strength. You know? Yeah, I mean, it requires let's... having the club in the right position as you come into the golf ball. Rotating through the golf ball is a wonderful thing. Way more people uh, thrust and, you know, get out of position because their legs kind of thrust forward and they, their pelvis gets closer to the ball through impact. Way more do that than not. Uh, some people just spin from the top. The rotation's great in the right sequence if you're strong enough to maintain the club face. So it's not as simple as just bow your wrist and then turn and you'll hit these great shots. It no, doesn't just work like that. It's effectively two potentially problematic things in your swing canceling each other out and producing a positive, right? When you bow the wrist and close the face relative to your forearm as a result, if you don't then open your body up by rotating incredibly large amounts through the impact zone, right? The face will be closed because it's closed relative to your forearm. If you open yourself up that much and you don't have the swing, the 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 uh, club close to your forearm, you will have the face very open and either hit big pulls shutting the face down or hit big fades. So it's the combination of these two elements that counter each other out. And, in you know, players like John Rahm, Dustin Johnson allows them to hit very consistent ball flight because the face isn't rotating a lot through impact. Their body's doing that work, and it's very good. And you're right. In concept, it's a great idea, which is why a lot of people are getting on board with this philosophy. Of mm, I don't know about a lot, but, you know, some are. I would say to average golfers out there listening that a little bit of closed club face with a little stronger grip, a little bit of wrist bowing, if they want to think about that a little bit, holding off the club face through impact, is better certainly than cupping the wrist and opening the face up. Certainly. Uh, that's a killer. So if you're going to air, having a little bit of bow in the wrist, a little bit of flexion at the top, a little bit of club face facing the sky. If you're a really strong player fighting a hook, it's a terrible idea. Um, I, I think I'd even change someone. If, if, if someone came to me with that position, and 
I'm not sure I'd just say keep that like it is and just turn more through impact because there's so much integration and sequencing required to doing it properly. I'd probably still try to get them to get the club more neutral at the top. But cupping the wrist and opening the face is not cool. And that's something you definitely have to fight. Uh, a little bit other stuff on a swing, because that does get all the attention. It's like a magic show, right? That's the David Copperfield. Look over here. And yeah, everyone's looking sure. at that in his golf swing. I think his leg action is tremendous. Uh, yes, there's no agreed. thrust in him. He's got great rotation through the ball. He's got quiet, strong legs. Very Nicholas-like. Very Ryan Moore-like. Uh, you know, there is a little bit of an undercurrent right now of Randall Chambly talking about lifting the front heel and turning deep into the back hip, which is a little more like Dustin Johnson. By the way, on that note, you see how ridiculous all the Jason Day takes are now? All those guys are starting to talk about how Jason Day... It's objectively his back problems are only because he doesn't turn enough in his hip yeah. and his back. Well, so. let's look at John Rom. John Rom has that beautifully stable, quiet footwork that I love for consistency in a player. Um, so I love that. And then the way the club shaft shapes, I think, is really important for people to understand. You've seen it now for four or five years teaching. I've seen it for 30. The average golfer uh, gets the club inside on the way back. They... They wing the club head inside by using their wrists and their arms and thinking that a flatter backswing will prevent a slice, and it actually causes it. So most people we see on the teaching tee lay the shaft off on the way back, and the only thing to do to fix it and hit the golf ball on the way down is to steepen it. Uh, John Rahm does an incredible job. Even though he's got that little bit of flexion in his wrist action, his forearm action, he keeps the club vertical going back, and it shallows beautifully. His transition... It, transition, easy for me to say, is immaculate. I just love it. The club's in perfect control at the top. Uh, yeah, it looks a little short because he doesn't have a lot of wrist hinge because of the way his, his wrists are moving. But he's got a full shoulder turn. His arms are in front of his body. The club drops into an incredibly consistent slot. We've actually got a, a, an image of him uh, up on our screen here behind us in our studio, and he's coming right down through you know, that 9 o'clock position on the way down, and that club is not trapped in behind him. He, he just he just really shapes the club shaft the right way when he swings. So I love the footwork uh, because it cr creates consistency, and I love the shaping of the golf shaft because it really leads to those high, straight drives coming a little more from the inside and working up through the golf ball, right? Awesome to watch. Yeah, what, what he shows really well, to your point about footwork, is that you can have the best of the get on top of the ball and then rotate through the golf ball quickly and not have to go crazy with your feet. Right? I think that as we understand more and more about ground force pressures and everything, we're realizing that if you're able to shift or slide your body into your front side, so you're able to essentially have that bump that we've all known is true for years with your body into your lead leg, and then rotate very quickly into your lead heel and clear, essentially fast, you will manipulate and gain more power. And a lot of guys have turned that to 11 and turned that into let your feet go crazy as long as you do that. But it takes a very special kind of body to be able to do that and still have consistency of posture. And John Rahm shows that if you get onto the golf ball properly and clear, you can have more calm footwork, be much more consistent than those players, and still get that clearing effect that hits the ball yeah. incredibly consistently and far. I also think his putting is incredible. He, he's not a choker at all. Well, like I you mean, said, he doesn't have a real weakness. You know, he doesn't have. I can't think of one place in his game other than that emotional element, which he will outgrow. That's something you can work on. And he's, you know, he talks about all the time how it's something he's working on trying to get a handle, and he's self-aware enough to know it's there. It's something he can overcome over time. Another thing I'd say to people is. John Rahm looks really comfortable over the golf ball, easily comfortable. When I look back at Nicholas getting over the ball, the cocking the head, the moving around, Nicholas talked a lot about postural issues when he swung and he wanted to stand closer to it. And then he, you know, and then Ernie Els, you see, he's always twitching around, wiggling his bum, trying to find posture. John Rahm just stands there. John Rahm looks like he was born standing over a club. He never looks awkward over yeah, the golf true. ball. He looks so comfortable over his putter. You know, other people kind of twitch their forearms and tuck their elbows in and raise their hands up and try to find that perfect position. John Rahm just seems to have this... He just looks so natural over the ball. It just... 
You know, it's the ultimate compliment that you make something just look easy. John Rahm makes everything look easy. He just kind of turns his shoulders back and beats on it. Uh, last thing about his golf swing. His arms really stay in front of his chest. He's got a big shoulder turn early. And that's another thing that make he's got the full turn without yes. the big arm swing. So if you watch him swing that club away from the golf ball, his arms really stay extended and in front of him. If you think about it, everybody, if you cut your if your golf swing shorter, how do you still hit it as far? And the answer is he's got that full turn, right? And very strong guy moving very quickly. Big man. Whether well, he's six yeah. one or six two at two twenty, I bet you every guy in the world who says there's two he's two twenty is about two twenty eight. You know, I, I would give probably John Rahm 230-6-2. He is a big man, uh, big frame. It's my favorite kind of golf swing. Uh, you and I on the teaching tee, you know, we, we teach the 45-year-old guy who's had a couple of too many lunches, you know, and a beer at lunch, and he's got a little belly, belly on him, and he's not quite as flexible as he should be. Are they be. having second lunches? Like, why are they having too many lunches? Well, you know what I mean? What no, restaurant lunch. lunches. I know what you mean. The restaurant you lunches yeah. with the, yeah, I'll <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, mean. I'll have fries with that. Yeah. yeah, give me the fries with that. And, and oh, the, well, I'm out. you know, the odd beer. Yeah. So that guy is more the, the every man. Yeah, it's yeah. great to watch Dustin Johnson, but, um, and John Rahm seems like that every man, right? He'd go out and he'd say, yeah, give me the fries with that. And his swing uh, is, is a good one to watch. It's rotary. It's not too long and flexible looking. It's strong. Not a lot of moving parts. It's a great one to copy. Darren Clark was my old go-to for that looking golf swing, yeah. that stockier guy uh, who liked the odd Guinness, you know. His was the move that I said, look at how clean his stroke, his golf swing is. Ian Woosnam's another one for different reasons, a smaller man, but very rotary. And John Rahm has a lot of that going. You don't see John Rahm's legs and knees flying out towards the target, right, which creates thrust and drops back the upper body, drops the club under plane, these leggy players, these long-limbed players, they look like they can get themselves into more trouble when they're not on. John Rahm just stands there, turns back, turns through. Yeah, it's well, really simple. I mean, to all the points we're saying, it's a simple, effective version that still takes a, the benefit of all these forces because of how well it's done, right? And I think, you know, I, I do think, to your point about his arm staying in front of him, he's an interesting case study in how, how long the swing looks has no real effect on how long the swing is. Right, how much you turn and how long your arm swing is is a different statement than how far your club looks like it's swinging. Again, because he flexes his wrist more than many individuals, he doesn't vertically hinge them as much. And so the club head doesn't look like it's swinging as big as other ones. I mean, Gary Woodland is another very similar parallel, right? Gary Woodland doesn't look like he has a long swing because there's not a lot of wristage at the top. But as you also said, Rom develops and Woodland developed the wrist hinge on the way down through good body mechanics and allowing the club to set. Sequencing. Oh, my goodness. And Have you ever watched uh, Woodland in slow-mo? That, that club has an incredible angle down. to it. Yeah. Well, I mean, not to draw parallels. Don't try to snap it, everybody. Careful. Don't try to snap it. It just happens, right? I mean, flexible athletes, strong athletes make things look doable. Sometimes people can't even do that. But he's got incredible angles coming down at the golf Yeah, course. I mean, not to, not, not to draw Amazing. parallels, but theoretically... That's how I hit the ball reasonably far without making a giant backswing, too. Mm -hmm. Right? Certain. Yes, it is. It shows that you don't need this incredibly long backswing to do it as long as the mechanics are solid. And that, you know, where Brooke Henderson's the opposite point, the club going as long as it is is the flashy show that everyone misunderstands how she gets there. John Rahm's club not looking as far as some of the other guys is the flashy show yeah, that same not kind of idea. how it gets there. Be very careful. Don't watch the club head too much. And then you've got Matthew Wolf, where we're all mesmerized. It's almost like, remember that Jungle Book scene where Ka had the, the spinny hypnotic eyes. I mean, that we're all is watching. A call out. We're watching Matthew Wolf, and our we're just mesmerized by. It. I think he's on the front of either Golf Digest or Golf Magazine. Yeah, yeah he was this month. Okay, uh, let's move on. What do you want to do next? Uh, President's Cup or Christmas gift ideas? Pick it. Uh, let's do Christmas gifts. Let's let's space out the let's space out the breakdown. All right. It's that time of year I said we were going to give some good ideas. Uh, uh, first of all, there are a lot of neat ones out there. I'm a believer that good gift giving requires a little bit of work. So some of mine require planning and work. By the time we're listening to this, I think it's still early enough to order some things. You have but, time. 
I think we have I think we have some time. So my number one one, Jake, and uh, you can jump in and we'll discuss them all. Uh, isn't just an experience. Uh, there's nothing better to get than the idea of a foursome is going to go to a private club they normally can't get into. Or, I mean, the ultimate thing would be to give someone a trip to Ireland or a trip to Cabot Links or something like that. But in every... Yes, we'll call this non-budget division. Well, yeah, a lot of mine don't have a budget. But listen, the work and the planning and the uh, almost, you know, the, I don't know, the nerve to go out and try to do some things can create great experiences. If you live in Ottawa and there's a course that's difficult to play in Toronto... Oh, no, there are definitely... You call the pro and you say, look, my dad's never gotten to play. I'm telling you, people, this stuff works. If, oh, no. if, if a pro totally. in Toronto gets a call and you say, my dad's 81 years old, he's always wanted to play XYZ golf course, he's never been able to, I'd love to bring him down next year. You know, some, some I suppose some, you know, directors of golf and pros out there might hang up the phone it's on you, but shot. it's worth a shot. I just went the trip to Ireland was non budget division, by the yeah. way. I, I, there's absolute ways to do it. And I think that you're getting at somewhat why it's so hard to find gifts for many golfers is golf is about the experience of the game. It's about experience playing it. So when you start looking at knickknacks for golfers, all the stuff, a lot of the stuff isn't great because that's not the point of it. The point With, of it is the experience. Within driving distance of Ottawa, you know, Oak Hill is down in Rochester. Yes. They've played majors there incredible golf course you know maybe call them and see if you can get on there if i mean scattered through the northeast you've got so many incredible golf courses and so, some you so maybe never have heard of even that now listen it can also just be a great day at a local club that includes a neat lunch out something thoughtful we're going to get up we're going to go down to this diner and have breakfast we're teeing off at 10 30 you know, I've organized this part of it, and so-and-so and so-and-so and so are going to caddy for us. And then we're going to go to lunch and have beers. Just create something. I, I think an experience is always the number one thing to give. And it's 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 not, it doesn't have to be crazy expensive to do it, but it requires a little bit of work no, and it's, planning. At the end of the day, that is what golf is, right? Like we're saying, that's what, you're, you're playing golf for the experience. Giving that to somebody is a pretty cool way to take advantage of what they like. Number two, some sort of education. Uh, this one always people might roll their eyes because we're in this business, but a launch session, a putter fitting, uh, a golf lesson. I mean, everybody wants to play better. Everybody wants to hit the ball better. Uh, I think people want information so they have a chance to hit the ball better. So any sort of education you can do. Uh, it can even be health and fitness. It can be anything, but... Uh, you know, the idea of giving someone a lesson or a package of lessons, a club fitting session, a launch session, a putter fitting, just some more understanding so they have a chance to play better. A trip away to a one, or two or three day school somewhere, go see someone they really admire. Any kind of education like that, I think, makes a great gift as well. Yeah, I, I, you know, I truly believe that learning new things is incredibly important to your development as a person, regardless of what that is. When you stop learning new things, is when you stop growing as an individual and when you start getting older and all those things. I think it's incredibly important to your health and to your mental state and everything. And if the person happens to be a golfer and you're the person who can maybe give them that experience and maybe make them realize what that can give them, I think that's an awesome gift. I think it's a gift that will be appreciated immensely. I mean, yes, we are golf coaches, so of course we're going to think it's a good idea. You're right. Some people might roll their eyes, but... I don't think it's crazy to say that giving somebody a new experience and giving someone the privilege to learn something new is a bad gift idea. If they're a golfer, give them a golf well, lesson. Well, I would say let, let's throw in a bunker lesson as uh, something that every golfer listening to this podcast could probably use to, to have a lot more chances to shoot better scores. Yes. People are, are, I would say, pretty general statement, terrible in the bunker. So if you can teach someone how to hit the golf ball out of a trap, it's a pretty cool thing. Playing lessons are neat as well. Call a local pro. Again, a little bit of nerve required, a little bit of planning. you got an assisted pro who's a really good guy at your golf club and organize a playing lesson. 
uh, a round of golf at a certain course or at your home course or whatever with that person. And there's all kinds of different ideas you can do, but educating and helping someone get better at the game. Uh, and I'd even include books into that. You could get into books. I've got a couple on my list a little later, but, uh, you know, a great golf book is also kind of a neat well, thing to give someone. Well, let's jump into books now. Why, sure. why go later? Let's jump into books. We're okay, give books. me a couple you like. Uh, you know, my favorite golf book recently has been Tom Coyne's Paper Tiger. Uh, Tom Coyne's a great golf writer. He also book wrote a book called A Trip Called Ireland, which I loved, uh, where he walked across the coast of Ireland on foot and played every Lynx course Not in a Ireland. A Trip Called Ireland. It's a walk? A is course called Ireland. A course, called, a course Ireland. called Ireland. And he played across the entirety of Ireland, and it, it's a very interesting read. And he wrote a book called Paper Tiger where he took time off to try to do everything he could to go pro and just see <laughs> if being obsessed was enough to get on tour. And it's a very interesting read of, you know, how much of it is obsessive work and how good you can get by doing the right things and how much of these tour players are talent. And I won't spoil what happens, but the book is, I like it a lot. Uh, Nick Bradley's books, either one of them I'd recommend highly. Kinetic Golf. They're great teaching se books. Seven Laws of the Golf Swing. Great illustrations. They're hardcover books. I like hardcover books. Nothing better than Christmas morning grabbing a coffee, uh, opening up a book in your favorite chair by a fireplace and flipping through it. Uh, lots of good teaching books out there, but uh, those Nick Bradley ones stand out for me as being a couple of good ones. Stay away from... Uh, my advice is to stay away from system books. You know, you go to the you go to the local bookstore and it's some kind of a, uh, you know, secret keys to the swing or you know, some of that stuff is a little gimmicky. Read right? or the one plane swing or this system of golf swing or, uh, I I wouldn't send people towards that, but there's lots of good ones out there. And, and then I want to get to the books I really like or the ideas when it comes to reading, which uh, more about course design, more about the soulful experience of being a golfer, you know, and, and connecting people with what's so beautiful and great about our sport. And uh, Keith Cutton wrote a book that a lot of people will already know about. It's called uh, The Evolution of Golf Course Design. Uh, Keith was actually, last time I was at Cabot Links in the fall, he was out there doing some work with them. He's, he's a Canadian brilliant shaper designer, but he, he wrote this book that's a wonderful uh, well, just just get it. It's a, a hard copy book uh, or a, a hard cover book. I mean, it's a beautiful coffee table book, beautiful imagery in it. But it's basically about golf course design. It's really great. Yeah, I think I think if you are into golf course design, it's a great book. And if you're not into golf course design, it will help you get into golf course design. Because I think more golfers that don't think much about the architecture... It'll help would you enjoy as a learning as well. that stuff more than you think, and it would make you a better player. Yeah. And I know that my goal for 2020 from a golf pro perspective is to learn more about it because I know what I like in golf courses and I know what I don't like in golf courses, and I know a lot about the course itself, but I don't necessarily know some of the architecture stuff of why things are built the way they are and why I like that. And I think I, I'm, you know, it's a book I want to read because it's a book I think that will it makes the experience get better, me in. right? If you learn about different uh a brit's green and and different things and why they're designed certain ways and how you're supposed to hit the golf ball into you know you got a punch bowl what's a punch bowl green and you learn about these different design philosophies and everything in architecture is based upon challenging a player and making it more interesting for them to play the game should i flight the ball in low here should i bring it in high am i better to be long of the pin or short of the pin the architect is always thinking about that as he's putting his 18-hole picture out there. Uh, so many of us just blindly whack at the ball and keep moving. Go, I kind of like number six, but you don't really realize why you like it, You know what type of design it is. Uh, and so it's really interesting reading. It, it really is. Uh, Catalog 18 is another Canadian book. Beautiful yes. imagery. Uh, it's not a hardcover book, but it's... It's a soft cover, but it's a substantial book full of uh, great golf holes, great photography, uh, great art. Tony Harris, our, our wonderful friend here in Ottawa, who's a world-class sports artist, but a golf artist first, uh, has a little section in there, a couple of pages in there. Uh, Tony Harris Art is another one. TH Fine Art is his website. Another great gift. 
uh, golf art kind of blends into the golf books, I think, is something every golfer would like. So I really like Catalog 18. And my other favorite, which your mom gave to me two years ago now, I just received my 10th issue in the mail just a few days ago, is the Golfer's Journal magazine. Comes out quarterly. Again, very much like Catalog 18. It's much more than just a magazine. It's the the images will really resonate with you and stay with you. It's a beautiful book. And it's got great essays in it. Uh, and not your typical essays. Uh, or how to get better at golf. Or six tricks to a better backswing. Or whatever. No, I mean... It's got... It, it's got they're really good reads. And they're the kind of things that you want to just sit down and spend some time with. And that makes for a great gift. I think it's, it's, it's for golf hipsters by golf hipsters. Right? People who are true fans. Am I a hipster? I think we are, yeah. I think to a little bit of an extent. I don't, I don't think I want to be a hipster. But I don't anyway. think, you know, but we're the we're the upper echelon of golf nerd. You know what I mean? Maybe that's the better term than hipsters, golf nerd. But it's it's really, really a love letter to golf. And, uh, you know, I'd much rather something like that than, you know, the average magazine subscription. Although any magazine subscription is a great gift because it's a gift that keeps on giving too, right? By the way, I just thought of something. Uh, uh Sign up for an event is another thing. We talked about that experience. Signing up for an event is an experience, too. Pick your favorite charity and sign a foursome up for that group and give that to three other people That's in your group, idea. right? So we're going to play in the, whatever, the, Ke the Kevin Hame Kids of the Course Classic to support our junior golf initiative. That's the event we want to play in. And you either enter a twosome or a foursome or the Heart Institute tournament or whatever's important to you at a course you'd like. Call the pro shop. Ask them what charity events they have there next year, and then sign a group up. It's another paying it forward, really neat gift that combines experience. That's a good idea. That's I haven't heard idea you say that one before. I really like that. How about one. that, everybody? How about that? Uh, something custom. Uh, let's get custom gifts. You've got the imprinted golf balls. Yes. Which is great. Been doing Titleist Pro V ones for years. You put a nickname on the side, a custom number. Still time to do that this year. Uh, we're big Titleist guys. We love that, but. Uh, Custom head cover. Tell everyone about your head cover we got you last year. That was a great gift. Yeah, so... From uh, who, too? Tell them where it's from. So, my my head cover, it's a Dormy Workshop head cover, which is a great company out of Halifax that makes high-end custom leather head covers. And uh, personally, mine is a Saint FX head cover. I put a picture of it on Twitter the other day after we talked about this kind of a gift idea segment on the radio. Um, and I love it. It's a really good, high-quality head cover. I mean... You're going to pay more for these than you are a normal head cover, but you're you're getting what you pay for. Um, it is incredibly good quality. The custom work is unreal. And uh, even just looking on their website and seeing a bunch of the ones that they do on their own without you requesting custom work. Yeah, Dormy Workshop's great. Stitch make custom these guys head are covers artists. too. That, that's, a, that's an American company. We like Dormy Workshop a lot. The guys are in Halifax. Well, and the so. nice thing about Dormy Workshop is they'll do one-offs. Right, not a lot of companies. It'll you, cost you over a hundred bucks to get one head cover, but they're leather. I mean, they retail for close to that anyway. If you want a one-off, you're probably late right now for Christmas. Three weeks before, four weeks before Christmas. No, you're but they have lots of great get. options on there that would be great for anybody on their website that are pre-made. So you're not too late to get it. Now. Pure Grips, uh, a neat grip company from down in the states. I've used their grips on my clubs. They'll put your name on the grip. Right in the grip, not printed, but literally right into the mold of the grip yeah. if you order 20 grips from them. So you can get the person's name on a grip. Anything. You can customize anything in golf. You can get, uh, you know, buy a wedge from Ping and they'll etch for a few dollars extra. Etch the person's name on the hosel of the golf shaft. Or, I'm sorry, of the club head in the back. Yeah. You can put a name or a nickname on there. Well, so stamping it. Wedge anything stamping custom like that. A big you can even buy a wedge stamping them. kit, right? That's a neat gift. Yeah, Buy someone a, a do-it-yourself wedge stamping kit, and then they can do that. Go to Michael's uh, and get some acrylic Sharpies, and you can repaint all the numbers and the scoring lines on the person's golf club. Uh, we do a lot of that customizing yeah. here. My, mine are all blue and orange from the University of Illinois, but, you know, you can do a number. The acrylic Sharpies are really cool. You can fill up the, you know, clean them all up first. Use a wire brush or a plastic wire brush. Uh, scrub them out. And then fill them with whatever paint color. You just wipe it with a, a wet cloth or a cl cloth with a little bit of, you know, acetone or uh, turpentine or something on there. And it'll clean it up beautifully. 
and then you've got this beautifully clean looking club head with all these custom colors in it lots of things like that you can do all kinds of stuff like that you can get if you go on the internet you can get umbrellas with people's names on them you can get towels done you can get alignment sticks with custom branding on them uh again go talk to someone like us talk to somebody at uh, a golf bar you can get custom hats made you can you can give someone the gift of a dozen custom hats with a custom logo on them you can get done uh you know we know who the sales reps are we know what companies can do that sort of thing so all of these are neat ideas that bring more than just hey here's something simple i picked up at the outlet mall so all, all kinds of really good stuff uh rainwear is another great gift i'm telling you i've been going to uh, uh, ireland now we've been there five or six times funny story this year there was a guy who had a rain jacket he bought a callaway rain jacket for 200 bucks at golf town and we were heading to La Hinch and it was pouring rain. He's like, I'm like, you good for a rain jacket? The guy's like, oh, yeah, I bought this Callaway one. I'm like, oh, I don't think you're good for a rain jacket. Like, I don't think that's going to quite do the job. So there's good and there's good. Uh, my advice to people, and they're extremely expensive, but a Galvin Green jacket or rain pants or anything from that company, uh, huge in Europe, It'll cost you five, six hundred dollars for a jacket, but you'll have that jacket the rest of your life and you will never get wet. So, you know, investing in really good quality rain gear is something cool. If you can't afford that, Imperial Headwear make a rain cap, a hundred percent waterproof rain cap. You can yeah, get those it for are neat. 50 bucks. You can get a really good umbrella. I'm not talking about a, a typical one that's going to blow inside out. The second you put it up, but you can get really good tour level quality umbrellas out there for about a hundred dollars. Rain gloves is the most affordable, a neat thing that every golfer should have. You actually wet them before you play, and then they're like a vice on your golf grips, even if they're soaking wet. They keep your hands a little warm too. So rain gloves are really great. Foot Joy make a great pair of those. Zero restriction make them as well. So you can get a rain cap, rain gloves, anything uh, for making that experience in harsh weather a little better makes a neat gift and is probably something the person doesn't already have. You, you can tell people how much I wear my Galvin Green jacket. I've Time. probably worn it 500 Time. times in the last five years. You know, it, it, It's light. You can swing in it. Uh, you can wear it in the wind and keep you warm. It, no rain gets on you. I'm wearing mine all the time, and I really, really love it. It's a great gift for somebody. Like I said, a little expensive, but something worth thinking about. What else you got? Anything? The last thing I'd like to say, Jake, it's a long list here, but is teaching aids. A simple, affordable teaching aid. Not a gimmicky club off the golf channel that is basically, a, I guess, a lie is the best way i can say it so no perfect clubs you know all of this stuff is just oh those drivers they're it's like a three wood but you hit it like a driver and it's all garbage mostly you know the sand wedge uh, the sand club that gets the ball out every single time i mean i'd much rather give the person a lesson to learn how to use something and understand a little bit more than i would a gimmicky club well, like the th that the thing i always but laugh teaching at. aids can be good right yeah 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 they can be you know i'm always a little bit hesitant on the teaching aid front because you got to give somebody that you know is going to work for their golf swing. And so if someone has a teaching pro that they work with and you talk to them and ask, hey, is there anything you'd recommend? I think that's a great idea. But I think before you just jump on Golf Channel, infomercial.com or wherever you'd get a teaching aid, uh, going and buying something random. I mean, if the person doesn't know how to use it, it can be one. But if you find the right one, it, it could be a very personal, interesting gift. But like you said, it just requires a little bit of work and research to figure out which one to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um... A mirror, a putting mat. Yeah, uh, let me give you no. Let me give you a putting. I mean, tool. is that a teaching aid? Is a putting mat a teaching aid? But things you can use in the winter time to work on your game a little bit. Uh, it's doable. You're right, though. You you sort of have to talk to an instructor yeah. first. If you're looking at a putting one, by the way, though, Putt Out is a great company for this. They make really good compact putting mirrors. They make a very good mat, and their little putting putt out putting aid is a great little tool where you basically you use that instead of a cup and it's the width of a cup and it's the shape of a cup but it has a ramp on it and if you putt into the cup it should slide up the ramp and there's a little hole right in the center and if you hit a putt that would pour perfectly into the bottom of the hole it'll stick in that and if you don't it'll fall off the sides the side that you would have missed the cup 
Not to mention that when it does come up the ramp, if it comes back down, that's how much you would have putted past the hole. So in terms of working on some pace this winter on your carpet in your garage, which a lot of people do anyway, I think that's a really good version of a putting uh, of a putting teaching aid that's not too expensive. Yeah, a few things. At. Little chip nets are neat. A person can chip in the basement or wherever. Uh, putting mats are doable. Little things like that, that that keep people going. Or yeah, talk to talk to a golf pro and maybe get an aid or two that might suit that person. You know, we're in the public realm here, so we have a lot of turnover, but there's a lot of people listening to this podcast who are at country clubs. And believe me, that golf pro knows that guy's golf swing. Yes. So if there are For 450 sure. members at a certain club and the pro's been there a long time, he'd have a pretty easy time helping you out coming up with something neat. Uh, so anyway, that's our list. There, there's more to it. You can keep going forever. Oh, of course. Uh, but I like I like experiences. I like knowledge. I like customization. Uh, I like good reads, good books. Anything a person can kind of get their teeth into and make them a little more optimistic. Uh, I, I think there have been studies that people actually prefer the day before Christmas to Christmas because looking forward to something is more impactful on the human brain than actually experiencing it. Oh, interesting. Uh, sometimes people are more excited to look forward to the trip to Disney World than when they're actually at Disney World, uh, and certainly afterwards. But uh, giving someone a golf item they can look forward to. How about tickets to a major? How about uh, tickets to Augusta National to a practice round? How about, you know, there's all kinds of different stuff I mean, like that. Do some work and, and find something cool. Wingfoot next year uh, is within driving range. Pretty easy driving range. You can go to Wingfoot in 20... 2020 that'd be pretty neat see mickelson potentially put one off the planet again to lose the tournament let's talk uh, president's cup a little bit it's coming up just next week uh u.s teams 10 1 and 1 the internationals are 1 1 and 10 yes uh the only one they won is where they're playing this year down at royal melbourne one of the top five courses in the world it's we're in transition here jake and i kind of like it I, I think the internationals are in more transition than the americans are Yes. A lot of rookies on, on both sides, actually. The Americans have five rookies playing. Uh, what do the internationals have? Seven rookies playing. Yeah, so it's a lot. I think it's impossible to pick the internationals, but I'm really intrigued to watch it. Um, yeah, I, I think the internationals, I mean, I'm, I'm more interested to watch this President's Cup than I have in the last couple for a couple of reasons. But one of them is because this, I think, is setting up what it's going to look like in the future. You're right. I think it's really hard right now to pick the international team with how strong the U.S. team, especially considering the rookies on the U.S. team aren't really rookie players. They're just haven't been on a President's Cup team before because U.S. golf is so deep right now. Um, when you're leaving until, you know, Kepka got injured and went off the team, Ricky Fowler off the team, you have a pretty deep squad to choose from. But well, the Americans is, the, I mean, it, it's the deepest country in the world and uh, it's like Canada with hockey players, right? Uh, you can there's always more talent in the second twenty or thirty. If there was a fifty person against fifty person event anywhere against whomever, everybody, including yeah. Ryder Cupers and internationals, the U.S. would still win it. If it was top fifty against top fifty, they're they're definitely deeper. Um, but uh, the internationals have a difficult time here. I mean, basically, they have nothing to rally. The the one thing the Ryder Cuppers have had is they rally against beating the giant and you know they've got a camaraderie they've got kind of an intensity about them and a a reason to be and that's always really worked well for them the internationals have a harder time you've got a, a chinese taipei you've got a you know a couple of koreans you've got a canadian you've got a south african you're kind of you know, you got players from all over the world. It's hard for them to really um, bond and have that purpose. Uh, and that's always been a challenge with an international squad like this. Do you really, though, think that's different? I, I have a little I bit do, of a yeah. hard time. I have a little bit of a There's hard time. There's no other way argument. to explain why the Europeans have done so well in the Ryder Cup. If it's not about passion and reason of being. Sure, but, they're, but the European players also historically have been much better. I mean, that's where golf started. Right. Golf has been played in Europe longer than anywhere. So the tradition of golf there and the permeation of the sport in terms of its culture is different. So you get more people playing golf to your Canada point. You get more people playing golf. Americans get... are better and deeper, Jake. There's no reason why the 
Europeans should have done so well in the Ryder Cup in the last 25 years. No, but I'm saying the part of the, the point I'm making isn't only in skill. The point I'm making is that they have more high-level players, but also the Ryder Cup is baked into their culture. There, all, there have only been 12 President's Cups. I mean, do you think that... I don't know that it's inherently harder for someone from you know, Korea to bond with somebody from Australia than it is for someone from the UK to bond with somebody from Spain. Both have different language barriers, both have different cultures, but there's not the history of bonding that's there yet. Yeah, you even have uh, language issues. Yeah, but you have language in issues cases. in Europe too. Not really. Everyone speaks English. You know, I mean, Sanjay, I, I don't know these guys well enough to give you the guy who might not speak as well English as another, but when you have, it's like bringing Russians into your hockey locker room and they don't speak any English. I, it complicates the ability to bond and have commonality and kind of have that foxhole mentality. We're in this thing together when when they're culturally so different. Maybe not. Maybe maybe that'll be an ex maybe with certain players that actually makes it more interesting and neat. But I, I think the internationals just haven't been able to rally around a certain philosophy or something. Now, you're right. Having been 1-1-10, one, one, and 10, maybe it's time that they're going to start saying, hey, enough of this, let's get rolling here. Maybe the certain personalities in that room, regardless of culture and nationality and language, happen to bond a certain way. Who knows? Well, or maybe I, they're just better now. We'll I'll, find out. Well, I think that's going to start happening. I love Abraham Answer. Uh, Neiman's another really interesting player. Hey, uh, Ben On and, and Sanjay Im. These guys are great. Ben On is the youngest guy to, I think, win the USM, right? Yeah, so well, I, I, there's and, some amazing players on that team this year. So that's why I say I think I'm excited to watch the team, even though I have trouble picking them. I think this is maybe a tipping point for what's going to come in the President's Cup. More Asian players, right? More players from a part of the world that is rabid about golf but hasn't broke out to the level that it should yet. It has on the LPGA Tour, and it's coming. You can see it by this list. Well, it's, that's what I'm saying it's on coming, the PGA right? Tour, right? More players from countries that haven't had uh, representation before. I mean, Abraham Hanser is the first Mexican player ever to play, and there hasn't been a player from Chile in the our President's Cup before, and Joaquin Neiman's on the team at 19 years old. I mean, we're getting representation that we haven't got because if you actually look at the Ryder Cup previously, it was maybe a Canadian or two, mostly South Africans and Australians. We're getting more representation now, yeah, which I think I like it. should it potentially up. tip the scales. I just don't think some of these players are ready for it yet. Because as much as you could get a scrappy team that comes out of nowhere, and that would be fun to watch, the team in the States is pretty impressive. Yeah, Patrick Reed and Tiger Woods playing, you know, Sunjay M and CT Pan. Uh, it's a little David and Goliath. So yeah. anyway, it'll it'll be interesting to watch. It'll be interesting to watch. I, I'm glad the Americans are finally turning over. I wish there were a couple more guys passing. I'd like to see Kepka on the team, of course. But uh, Matt Kuchar, enough. You know, we've seen that enough. We got rid of Furyk. We got rid of Mickelson. So here's a question Tiger for Tiger Woods is an exemption. Uh, he's he's 24, 15, and 1 all time on the President's <laughs> Cup team, and he's the greatest player ever. So kind of fun to see him be a playing captain this year but but i i'm ready for them all to kind of turn over do you think that so tiger picked ricky really fast when kepka announced he wasn't able to play probably because tiger had decided at that point that if someone was coming on it was going to be ricky sure Fowler. well he did all the homework and the stats to figure out who he was going to pick in the first place do you think ricky fowler training for brooks kepka is an advantage for the american team or not because i kind of think it is I kind of think Ricky's a better player to have there than Kepka is, despite Kepka being the best player in the world right now. I think from a team perspective, Ricky contributes more to the culture of that team and is a better player long term to have as a leadership figure and keep him on these teams. Than That's Kepka certainly is. our perspective as fans. Uh, yeah, I mean, Kepka is pretty obvious with so many statements that he doesn't really want to be a team guy anyway. I mean, Kepka so should be on that I'll team. I'll agree with you there, but we really don't know whether they respect, you know, you don't know whether Xander Schauffele giggles at the concept of the public persona Ricky Fowler or he really admires him. We have no idea. We're not inside the room. You know, we all thought uh, Tiger wouldn't pick Patrick Reed because of all this so-called tension between the two. You know, 
some of this stuff's in the media and it's not even close no, to you the know what reality. I think, no, but I, I think that is real. I just don't think Tiger cares. I think Tiger is a numbers guy, like you just said, and that he will not make an emotional choice. Oh, I don't know. Patrick Reed kind of threw Tiger under the bus or tried to. In, in, in public, that's the way it came out. We don't know inside the room. Oh, no, no. There's no way he didn't. He made up. He made up a story about Tiger apologizing to him about how the round went after he shot 84 in Paris. Patrick Reed threw everybody under the bus. There's no way, Dad, that, that was a background. Everything was okay issue. I mean, clearly it was a problem. But I just don't think Tiger made his choice that way. I think Tiger made his choice based on who he thought. See, I, I would tend the to best think to that win. in the room, in the places that we don't see, that Patrick Reed, or maybe he said something that said, "Ooh." I shouldn't have said that, and he, he texted Tiger right away. He said, sorry, man, I misspoke, and, and the media has run with it, you know? So I, I'm just saying we don't know. It's like it's like listening to hockey fans talking about team chemistry. You really don't know whether a guy's a jerk or really liked in the room because unless you're in that room, you don't understand the dynamic, right? No, but I do think golf... Agreed completely, but I think in this case it's a pretty fair statement. He he backed up his statements a couple times, and he went out of his way to talk to the reporters. He didn't say something in the press conference and go oopsie. He pulled a reporter <laughs> to the side after the press conference and says, "I didn't get to say what I wanted to say. Here's the story." And you know, for that reason, I was surprised that that Patrick Reed was picked. I would have picked Jordan Spieth over I would have picked Patrick Reed. And I don't think Jordan Spieth should be on this team from a skill perspective right now. I think Jordan Spieth, though, is a long-term figure. Yeah, in I like both golf. of those. Actually, both of those guys would be on every one of my teams because they'll make the putt under pressure. I would put Reed and Spieth on all of my teams before Fowler. So, from the perspective of Ricky is an uber talent, super nice guy, marketing machine. tsunami. Yeah, you know, but he's missed some putts that have prevented him from winning that major. Whereas yeah. Reed and Spieth are a little more killer instinct. And that's why I think Tiger picked him. I yeah. think Tiger picked him because Tiger sees his legacy as I want to win this thing. My first captain choice, I don't want to be the loser. And I think regardless of how he might feel against Reed, I think he thinks I he's love the better Patrick player Reed. for the team. I mean, I don't like Patrick Reed. He's I'm a good villain. Gonna, I'm not going to buy his jersey. <laughs> but I mean, the old wagging the or the shoosh thing at the uh, Ryder Cup and everything in, uh, in Europe. Yeah. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Look, I, Who are you I looking think... most... Like, what match, if you look... So we've got DJ, JT, Cooch, Xander, Webb, Simpson. Ugh. I mean, Webb Simpson and Matt Kuchar, I wouldn't walk across the street to go watch play those two. No, but uh, Webb's DeChambeau, killer. I, I can't stand him. I can't stand... Well, I can stand him, but I, I, I don't want to watch him reading his books from 15 angles. Patrick Cantlay, best putting stroke. I mean, Patrick Cantlay and Ricky Fowler have the best two putting strokes on that team. I guess you got to include Woods in that group. Yes. Yeah. Uh, best clutch putter ever with Nicholas. Uh, Gary Woodland, Tony Finau, Reed Woods, Fowler. Who do you want to watch the most? I mean, Woods is always <laughs> number one for me. Woods Reed. I mean, I go to Woods Reed right away. And now, that's see, I want to watch. I want to watch Bryson and Reed because I want to watch Bryson take forever and Reed after the press conference light him on fire. <laughs> and let's throw Adam Scott in there too because he'll give Adam Scott some aim point long putter comments too i think that would be interesting who you put was xander shoffle uh patrick cantley uh i think patrick cantley and xander would be a very interesting young team uh uh, uh tony fina with dj both ripping it huge that'd be a good team too yeah i love those guys okay international team matsuyama adam scott okay adam scott it's time for him to move along with kuchar 14 20 and 5 and love the good. golf swing love the guy but uh Ustazen, Another kind of underachiever, the most beautiful swing on tour for a decade, and just a little bit of an underachiever. Leishman, Abraham Answer, Hao Tong Lee from China, um, Cameron Smith. I really like him as a player. He is scrappy from Australia. I think people are going to really enjoy watching him. CT Pan, actually, CT actually works out down at Blue Jack National where I was a couple of weeks ago. I went down there for a couple of days and did oh, some playing. And CT's a hard, hard worker. The members were telling me. 7 a.m. He starts putting and chipping and pitching and bunker. Has a lunch, goes back out, works all day every day. Incredible work ethic on CT, uh, CT Pan. Sanjay M. Uh, Neiman's another really interesting young player. Adam Hadwin. Uh, 
I don't know what his weakness is except size. And then uh, Ben Ahn is another uh, incredible player. As I said a little earlier, he won the USAM. How old was he? Was he the youngest to win it? I don't know. I, I read I some know. kind of a stat about yeah, that. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Ben Ahn is, is an incredible young player. Uh, who do you want to see on the international team? I mean, that's really hard. I, I think chemistry for that team is going to be very, very interesting. I'm tempted to say you want all the young players to play together. Like, I think Neiman and Smith could be a wild pairing. I mean, those two guys could like light it. the world on fire or or flame out. I think they're very interesting. I, I think Leishman and Oosthuizen would also be a very interesting pairing. Two, you know, guys with pretty similar games, really steady, but maybe and maybe haven't cracked the wins as many as they should have. But those are studs. Those guys yeah. are consistent, strong golfers. Yeah, we got to be careful not to take the two Koreans and say they should be a pairing right away because they're. They're both from Korea. You know, that that's kind of a, a ridiculous thing to do. I think we tend to do that. You know, you put Hao Tung Lee with C.T. Pan. And, yeah. But I, I don't think necessarily that has to do. It'll be interesting to see Ernie Els pick those pairings. By the way, uh, However, ben, on, ben on in 2009 in August won the USM, youngest player to ever win it. He was born in 91, September. So when he won the USM in August 09, what was he, 17 years old or? That's crazy. 91 to 01 to... He was eight, yeah, 18, maybe? Or was he still 17? Pretty amazing. Yeah. Anyway, won the U.S. Amateur, so he can obviously play some match play. And he's a good player. Uh, Sanjay M., another great player. Your your uncle, who kills me always in our money race pool, annually picked Sanjay M. and did really well with him in yeah. the season-long money race pool. So he's another terrific player. You know, I do think... I do think you're right that you have to be careful just to make that assumption. And I don't think necessarily that CT Pan and Hao Tong Lee are a good pair, but I do think in this case, actually the two Koreans happen to be a good pair. I think that Sung Jae M is incredibly talented, but is, is a, is r a fresh rookie. I think the reason why Al's picked Ben Ong Yang when, you know, Jason Day pulled out is because he sees him as somebody who has a little more experience and can help Sung Jae M and bring him forward. I, I think there is a reason that hmm. he was the extra guy picked. Because you can make an argument that he should have picked Corey Connors to go pair with Adam Hadwin um, with how well Corey you Connors has played. You could pick that. Yeah, you could have. So right. I, I do think that you know they happen to be a very interesting pair. And like a kind of Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth, who a lot of people considered last year in the President's Cup or two years ago, sorry, to be a little American dream team, I think those two guys could be a powerhouse together. Uh, long term, and I, I think that if this team is going to be an incubator for the future of international golf, um, get some of those teams together early, and I think you could see some interesting stuff. That it is. I really like the team makeup. If you put little pins on a world map, this is an intriguing team. It is. You've got a Canadian on there. You've got representation from Asia. You've got representation from Australia. You've got representation from South Africa. Uh I, I, it's, it's a, and, and South America too, right? In Neiman. So very cool team. I'm still picking the Americans, but, uh, I really hope the internationals make a match of it and make it interesting and maybe win it. That would be cool. It would be very cool. I mean, we are going to a course that was the site of the only international win. You know, Royal Melbourne was where the internationals won last time and quite handedly actually when they won, I think it's a course where they can be more competitive, you know, people keep talking in the Ryder Cup how the Europeans are making short tight courses and the Americans are making long bomb and gouge courses. Royal Melbourne is kind of a middle ground. It's, you know, 7,050 yards. It's a ball rounding. strikers golf course. And it it's is on the iron, sand belt. Yeah. It's windy. The bunkering is epic. It's one of the most beautiful courses you will ever lay eyes on. It's worth a watch, but you got to you got to golf your ball there. It so, is not a middle of the road golf course. It is no a monster, agreed. and so, the greens are incredible. And it'll it'll for that reason be very interesting to see how the two teams stack up from that perspective, because you know there's amazing ball strikers on both teams, and I think for that reason it'll be it should be some interesting matches. Fun course to watch. All right, and my man. The PGA Tour is doing a smart thing, having them end on Monday, so we can watch on Sunday in prime time. Yeah, and I like it now, too. It's it's late. It'll be the only thing on to get our attention, so I, I do like it. Really neat. Happy Christmas season, man. Yes, and, happy uh, Christmas season. To everybody out there, thanks for listening in 2019. It was a great 2019. Tiger was my highlight, obviously, this year. 
Uh, go out there and get those custom gifts, those experiences for the, the golfer on your list, everybody. Have a great time watching the President's Cup. Have a healthy, safe, happy holiday season. And uh, we'll be back in early January to set up 2020. Yes, we will. Uh, break down some more incredible golfers, including our little work on uh, John Rahm today. And lots more in 2020. It's going to be an exciting year coming up. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thank you very much.